Please turn with me in your Bibles then to the first epistle of Peter as we continue our verse by verse study through this great book of the Bible. We're into chapter 5. Today we're going to look, Lord willing, at verses 2 through 4. First Peter 5, verses 2 through 4, reading from God's holy word. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may your spirit of truth, the author of your truth, now convict our hearts of this truth, reality as perceived by you, and apply it to our minds, hearts, and our wills. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know well by now that the context we're dealing with in 1 Peter is Peter is writing to persecuted saints in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which is modern-day Turkey, an area approximately 300,000 square miles. It's interesting to me that at the time of the writing, there were over 4,000 churches that began with just these few churches in Turkey, rose to 4,000 churches, and now those churches are basically all mosques in Turkey today. Chapter 5, Peter addresses the elders, the leaders. Why does he address specifically at this part of his epistle here, the leaders and the elders? The answer is because they will receive the brunt of the persecution. Paul echoed the reality in 1 Corinthians 4.9 when he said, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles last, as men condemned to death, for we've been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Friends, it's true in the persecuted church today. As Wayne has shared many times about persecuted believers, they strike the pastors because you strike the pastors, you get at the flock, and you scare the flock, and the flock disperses, and you damage the church of God. Jesus said essentially the same thing, Matthew 26, 31, which is a quote from Zechariah 13, 7. On the night that he was arrested, he said, you, he told his disciples, you strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. The elders is Christ before them and the church at large. We all live day to day under the biblical principle, the pathway to glory is through suffering. The pathway to glory is through suffering. Romans 8, 16 through 18. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So Peter gives an exhortation here to the elders of the church in chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. His desire for them is that they be true to their role as leaders and they live each day with eternity in view. Peter wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He had a sense of urgency. We know that from chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. The rapture is imminent. Christ could come back at any moment. And so do we live that way in light of our own experience from day to day. And that should be true, especially so, when experiencing sorrow. We need to live life in that perspective in light of the glory, then, that shall be revealed. Verse 1. Peter says, the elders who are among you, I exhort. I who am a fellow elder and also a, a witness of the sufferings of Christ and the glory then, a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. You remember Peter here addresses them in light of Gethsemane, in light of Calvary, in light of the Mount of Transfiguration. As it says in 2 Peter 1, 15 through 19, he was an eyewitness of these events. And then in Matthew 17, 1 through 9, remember he was, James and John, he was with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured before them and God spoke, this is my beloved son, hear him. 
It's always encouraging for you and I to know that the one who speaks, he's been there, he's done that. He speaks from a position of wisdom and the school of hard knocks. Peter was not an Eliphaz to the suffering Job in Job chapters 3 and 4. He was not a miserable com comforter, one who spoke merely in terms of generalities about things that he had never experienced himself. Spurgeon said this, a man is never made thoroughly useful unless he's had suffering. Peter knows wherever he speaks, friends, that God is over all and that he knows what he's doing even amidst the frowning providences. We need to hear what Jesus said to the churches in Revelation 3.22. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. As a threefold denier of Christ, Peter was recommissioned to the Lord in John 21, 15 through 17. So now a humbled Peter is used by God to commission these church leaders to stay the course, remain faithful to Christ, be obedient to God's commands, and do so in light of the great reward that they will receive when Christ returns. As you and I look at this text today, may God's Spirit teach us. May He motivate us to pray for elders that these God-given marks here of a true elder be manifested in the elders, including the pastor-teacher of this church, this body, and that God would grant the church grace to thrive spiritually to His glory, to the furtherance of His kingdom, and to our eternal good. What are marks of a true elder? What are marks of a true elder? The first point is they have a commission. They have a commission. Verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. The task of the elders is now made explicitly clear. They're to function as shepherds of Christ's flock. Since Christ, it says in verse 4, is the chief shepherd, then all the pastor elders, the elders in a church, are under shepherds. They're under the authority of Christ. In all humility, they are servant leaders as Christ was. Matthew 20, verse 28, even as the Son of Man, Jesus said, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The elders also function as stewards. In 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, which is a great chapter for ministers, it says, a man so consider us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it's required in a steward that a man be found faithful. A steward is oikonomos in the Greek, means a house manager, a house manager. And we know from the qualifications of the elders in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, it says in verses 3 through 4 that the elder must manage his own house well first if he is ever considering going to manage the house of God. When we look at this verse 2 here, we see there's a twofold role for church elders. A twofold role for church elders. Number one, they are to shepherd the flock of God. And number two, they are to oversee the flock of God. Shepherd the flock of God. Poimnion in the Greek. It means to feed, tend, care for. It's a diminutive term. It's a term of endearment. A term of endearment. I remember uh, one pastor who said, love them enough. To wait for them. Love them enough to wait for them. The sheep are precious to God and they are to be precious to the elders, to the pastor elder also. Number two, oversee the flock of God. Oversee the flock of God. Exercise oversight. An overseer. One who is above others for the purpose of leading. They are to be servers. What does it mean to serve? It means to put others' welfare above your own. Put others' rights above your own. A church elder is a servant leader. Matthew 23, 11 and 12. He that is greatest among you, Jesus said, will be your servant. He who exalts himself will be abased. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Again, Matthew 20, verse 28. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister or serve and give his life as a ransom for many. An overseer. He's a bishop, an episkopos. Elder is presbyteros. A pastor, poimen, a shepherd. The overseer, the elder, the pastor. Those terms are all used interchangeably in Scripture. 
at Grace Baptist here, our church polity is the pastor is a fellow elder among other elders. The pastor is a calling then to preach and teach. And this varies, remember I've shared this before, with Baptist polity back in the 19th century and the early 20th century, where Baptist polity then by and large was you had one elder in the church and that elder was the pastor. And then the other officers in the church then were called deacons. I have a problem with that. It's not biblical. I have another problem with that. It tended too often to produce an authoritative, ocratic, my way or the highway type of leadership. A king pastor, so and so, etc. Luther said this, the best way to shepherd the flock of God was to preach and to teach God's word, the gospel. The best way to shepherd the flock of God. Preach and teach God's word, the gospel. For sheep ultimately to follow their Lord, they must know the way of the Lord. Psalm 119, 104 and 5, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I eat every false way. Thy word is a, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In verse 1, you'll notice it's interesting there that the elders are among the flock, whereas in verse 2 here it says that the elders are over the flock. You see a problem there? There's a tension, isn't there? There's a tension. There's a tension and a balance. So many of Bible truths are that way, that we must maintain a tension and a balance between among and over. An elder needs both relationships. He needs to pastor the flock. He needs to shepherd the flock, tend and care for them. He needs to be one of them, to be among them, identify with them and their hurts and their pains and their grievances and their afflictions, etc., etc. But at the same time, he needs to be over the flock. He needs to be the preacher. It's just like in Nehemiah 8, where the pulpit is raised up, where it represents God's authority, God's sovereignty. And the pastor then, from a raised pulpit, preaches, teaches God's word as God's representative. And what's the seriousness of all of that is Hebrews 13, 17. He must give an account for those souls who he is shepherding, the flock of God. What are the marks of a true elder? The first one is they have a commission. The second point is they have a contrast. The second point is they have a contrast. The end of verse 2 and verse 3. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly nor as being lords over those entrusted to them, but being examples to the flock. So in the remainder of verse 2 and then in verse 3 here, Peter lists these three contrasts of how an elder should not behave as opposed to how he should behave. Another way of stating that is he is contrasting false elders with true elders. False elders with true elders. And the ch professing church, the visible church, friends, has always had both false elders and true elders. Leave your uh, finger there in our text and just turn back a couple pages to Jude. Jude, verses 3 and 4. Jude, verses 3 and 4. Jude, verses 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation... I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is this epistle of Jude so short? Well, he was going to sit down and write a long dissertation, a treatise here on the doctrine of salvation. But then word came to him that apostates had entered the professing church already. And so he quickly then wrote this short epistle to the beloved, to the saints of God of the church. And he says in verse 4, and verse 4 is a definition of apostates. Certain men crept in unnoticed. The prophecy is they were long ago marked out for this condemnation. They're portrayed as ungodly men. That is their their. Of practice, their conduct, they turn the grace of God into lewdness. Their character is ungodly men, and their conduct is they, they uh, turn the grace of God into lewdness. They pervert the very grace of God. And then most importantly, what do these false teachers, these apostates do? 
Their creed is they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Now I'll turn back then to our text again in 1 Peter 5. In Matthew 7.15, it says, Wolves there will come in sheep's clothing. Wolves will come in sheep's clothing. Paul there, when he had his last meeting with the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 29 and 30, said this, For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, note this, from among yourselves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to us to draw away disciples after them. The crying need, friends, for our day is discernment. Discernment. I encourage you to read, we have it in our library, John MacArthur's book, Fool's Gold. A call for discernment in a non-discerning age. What is discernment? Discernment is the cognitive ability to understand, interpret, and apply doctrinal truth skillfully. You want a proof text for discernment is 1 John 4.1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. A fascinating verse to me in Scripture, it always has been, is 1 Corinthians 11.19. There must be factions among you that those who are approved may be made manifest. Did you get that? There must be factions among you that those who are approved may be made manifest. Until Christ returns and you separate out the goats from the sheep, you separate out the tares from the wheat, you separate out the light from the darkness, the true from the false, is that you will have the false in with the true. The visible in with the invisible. The professors amongst the possessors. You're going to have that mix and we need discernment to judge between. The simplest definition of discernment is Hebrews 5.14, to judge between the evil and the good, what is according to God's truth and what is not. Historically, God has used, interestingly enough, these false elders and their heresies to sharpen the truth and to define and strengthen the faith of two believers. Why do I say that? It's exemplified especially through the first four or five centuries of the church. When in all Arianism and all of these heresies that were arising against the deity of Christ, against the humanity of Christ, and the councils met from, from um, uh, Chalcedon to Ephesus to Nicaea, all these early councils met and the believers got together and what did they do? They came up with the credos, the creeds, I believe, these confessions of faith that were against these falsehoods. And God used those false teachers and elders then to sharpen the truth and to refine and strengthen the saints so they could stand against the air uh, strong, then be strong. J. Gresham Machen said, for truth to be maintained, it must be sharply differentiated from air. And friends, that is just the opposite of modern evangelicalism today. That welcomes the world into the fold and has a very generic statement of faith. You could, in the evangelical churches in Wilmer, you could take a hat on Sunday morning, put the confessions of faith in there, stir them up, and pick one out, and they're all the same, and you can go and attend, if you do so on that basis. They're all the same. And it's going just the opposite from history where when air is present, you sharpen the truths, whereas now it's being watered out in terms of an ecumenism today, and that tends to delete truths and not to stand for truth. Again, J. Gresham Machen said, truth to be maintained must be sharply differentiated from air. Tozer in the crucified life, he's just like Peter. He contrasts the true spiritual guides with the false guides. And why the contrast? Because as Oskin it says, Contrast is the mother of clarity. The stating of the opposites heightens clarity. J. Gresham Machen says this, you cannot set forth clearly what is a thing without placing it in contrast with what it is not. All definition proceeds by way of exclusion. Tozer says this, for every true guide, there is a multitude of false ones. Did you hear that? For every true guide, there is a multitude of false ones. Now remember, this is true in the visible church until Christ returns. 
2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Satan and his ministers, what do they do? They come across as angels of light, as ministers of righteousness, and they come into the professing church. Tozer says you gauge a potential guide by his use of scripture. The most dangerous spiritual guide of all is one who has 95% spiritual truth and only 5% evil. And that 5% evil triumphs over the 95% good. It's just like Mark Twain said. You mix a little falsehood in with truth and it can go halfway around the world before truth ever puts its shoes on. And friends, the question that comes to my mind is, who can discern the air that comes in unless you know the truth? Who can discern the air that comes in unless you know the truth? Spurgeon said, if you don't know the Bible, it isn't long before everybody is right. My prayer for each one of you at Grace Baptist is Acts 17.11. I pray it all the time that you would be Berean Christians. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Secondly, Tozer says, a false guide avoids certain passages of scripture. A false guide avoids certain passages of scripture. He picks and chooses what he's going to teach and preach on. I've got red flags waving all over because what is going on today in modern evangelicalism? It is so popular as topical sermons and topical sermons only. The pastor preaches on some particular popular hot button of the day or what he likes and that's it. Exegetical preaching, which is what the Reformation was founded on, verse by verse going through and interpreting scripture is out the door. It's not popular today. And that, to me, is the only true way of preaching. Yes, you can preach topically occasionally. But exegetical preaching is the only true preaching. Why? Because then you fulfill what Paul said in Acts 20, 27. I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. That's why when you come to Grace Baptist, there's the book of Genesis, verse by verse in Sunday school. There's verse by verse through 1 Peter, or Sunday morning, Sunday night, verse by verse through the book of James. Wednesday night, verse by verse through the Psalms. And you see, it challenges the teachers and the pastor, the elder, to deal and wrestle with texts that normally he wouldn't wrestle with. But he must before God because it is all of God's truth. Number three, Tozer says a false guide uses extra biblical material. Huh. Like such as Apocrypha, the Book of Mormon, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, psychology, philosophy, and therapeutic books. The best you know. I remember years ago, and I've shared this before, I went to a Bible study of a local church. 25 men, senior pastor, associate pastor among the 25. A Bible study. And they got up and it was sharing time. Everybody was to share the Bible study. And they got up and they said, I'm reading so-and-so's book. And I'm reading so-and-so's book. And I'm reading so-and-so's book. And finally, I had enough. This is not a Bible study. It's a book study. And when they announced what happened in the meeting, somebody must have had a little conscience twang because they said everybody shared the books they were reading. It wasn't Bible study at all. It was just somebody's book. And it's so popular today. And I'm so thankful in our Sunday school and in the teaching preaching, the emphasis here is on the Bible, God's Word. As John Wesley says, we are people of one book. Yes, you can read other books that are adjuncts, but there is only one book. And we are people of one book. Number four, Tozer says, false guides pay undue emphasis on themselves. They pay undue emphasis on themselves. You've got cults. Ah. And a real irritation to me is mega pastors who use big screens. Mega pastors who use big screens. You see, you've got to, you have these satellite campuses. And then you have to be on the screen of the satellite campus? You're that important? And I know of one mega church pastor in the Twin Cities. 
who has a multiple staff of preaching, teaching elders, and also has a seminary with 16 students now per year. And you mean to tell me they can't find somebody to fill the pulpit on a Sunday morning who is called by God to preach and teach in that satellite location? I turn on TBN once in a while. I told you before, the remote goes there, but it's just for sermon material, you know, interaction. And what nauseates me is the use of personal pronouns. All it is is I, myself, me, and all. That's all I hear all the time. See, overemphasis on self. You know, we sing songs like this. I hope we mean them when we sing them. All the glory belongs to Jesus. All the glory belongs to Jesus. Let others see Jesus in me. May his beauty rest upon me as I seek the lost to win. And may they forget the channel seeing only him. John the Baptist is a good example for us. A man can receive nothing except what he receives from God. John 3.27. So what did John the Baptist say in John 3.30? He must increase and I must decrease. So what does Tozer say is the characteristics of true spiritual guides? True spiritual guides. Number one, they know and believe and embrace all of Scripture. All of Scripture. They don't pick and choose. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is God breathed out and is profitable for doctrine, for instruction, for correction, etc. Number two, they know human nature. I think it's very important that you espouse the doctrines of grace. That it all begins with total depravity. As David said in Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and sin did my mother conceive me. In Romans 3.23, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Number three, practices the inward life. He knows that Luke 6.45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And he knows 1 Kings 8.39, God alone knows the heart. In Proverbs 4.23, for out of the heart comes the issues of life. Numbers four, he exudes fresh spiritual spirituality. Fresh spirituality. No dead orthodoxy. It's a living faith. He evidences progressiveness in sanctification. 2 Peter 3.18 He's growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Number five. He experiences the same difficulties as everyone else. Huh. I've shared this before too. One evangelical church we attended once, there was a senior pastor and a junior pastor, associate pastor. And the associate pastor had gone through deaths in the family, illnesses, troubles with teenagers, you name it. The senior pastor hadn't gone through any of it. So basically 100% of the time when a difficulty arose in the congregation, who did they go to? Who did they go to? The one who had experienced the same difficulties essentially they were experiencing because he had true empathy. You see, true empathy. Number six, devoted exclusively to God. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. He loves the Lord his, his God with all his heart, his soul, and his mind. He doesn't say to his wife, I love you with all my heart. No, he says that alone to God, exclusively to God. And then in that light, he says to his wife, I love you. You see, and she knows that is true love, true love. He has a high view of God, a high view of Scripture, a high view of the gospel. Number seven, he hates evil. Hates evil. Psalm 139, 21 and 22, David hates what God hates. May that be true of elders too, pastor, teacher, elders. They realize the heinousness of sin. As Sproul says, sin is cosmic treason against God. Now, let's look specifically at what Peter says here. In verses 2 and 3, three contrasts between true and false spiritual guides. We'll look at their attitude, their ambition, and their approach. Their attitude, their ambition, their approach. Number one, their attitude. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not by compulsion, but willingly. True spiritual guides, friends, have a calling from God. A calling from God. There's a compulsion there. I must preach. I must teach. 
I'll never forget that. When I had a seminary prof ask me once, and he was teaching one, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Because I was in middle age and called by God to go in the ministry. And that was the same person he was talking to that went to the Twin Cities when there was a snowstorm and I counted 29 vehicles in the ditch on the way down. I had to get there. There was a compulsion. A calling from God. A calling from God. It's a labor of volunteered, passionate love. Whereas the false guides, what do they do? They have a job to do. It's a labor of forced, indifferent work. For a pastor who has a true calling, this is a place of seriousness. It's not for jokes. You know what the greatest danger is for a pastor elder? You know what the greatest danger is in America? Laziness. It's laziness. Remember Charlie Rich? Nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. You don't know. You don't know what I do behind closed doors. But God does. God does. Hebrews 4.13, Neither is there not anything that is not manifest in His sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. There's a church in our area where the church got a bunch of bills from the internet one time. What are these bills for? Well, they checked it out. Pornographic sites on the internet. The pastor behind closed doors was looking on porn on the internet, occupying his time. George Vermer, I've heard him down at a Piper pastor's conference, operates a worldwide missionary organization, says that one pastor every minute of every day falls to internet porn. Idle time is the devil's workshop. Misuse of time. Not taking seriously his calling, his accountability before God. Lazy with his time. James 3.1, be not many teachers, you will receive the greater condemnation. Secondly, their ambition. Their ambition. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. I like what the King James says. Not for filthy lucre. That puts it pretty blunt. Not for filthy lucre. Elders must not be greedy. It says that right in 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, qualification of an elder. They must be acutely aware of covetousness. Hebrews 13.5, be not covetousness. Be not covetous in your conduct, but be content in the things that you have. For he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. As John Piper says, the opposite of covetous is contentment, being satisfied with everything that God has for us in Christ. Being satisfied with everything that God has for us in Christ. False teachers throughout Scripture were lovers of money. What did it say of the Pharisees in Luke 16, 14? Lovers of money. Lovers of money. What have archaeologists discovered on the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the Sanhedrin and all that? They got the biggest tombs, the most ornate tombs. They had the biggest mansions in all of Jerusalem, biggest houses there were, and filled with opulence. Filled with opulence, affluence all over. What did the money changers do? They charged four or five times the rate they should have charged for those sacrifices in their coinage exchange. And they pocketed all that extra money. 1 Timothy 6.5, suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Ravi Zacharias in his book, The End of Reason, found out there was an atheist attending a seminary. An atheist in seminary. And so he went to that atheist. He says, what are you doing here? And their answer was, to make money. I want to make money. There again, friends, there's a tension and a balance. You've got to make some money to live, but too much money. That's why I always, I always quote to my children, Proverbs 30, and now it's leaving my mind just when I want to quote it here. But Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of God in vain. That's good teaching from not only for an elder, pastor, but it's good teaching for parents too. And parents to each other and also to their children. Good rule to live by. 
1 Timothy 6, 6, 6, it says there, those who are taught the word should share in all good things with him who teaches. 1 Timothy 5, 17, it says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So it's a church's responsibility to support the pastor and not at a poverty level. I think this is a real dichotomy in our modern evangelicalism today because we have large churches that have multi-million dollar budgets and the average church size in America is 80, 80. And a lot of these small churches are struggling. You've got pastors, pastor elders that have got to be bivocational to survive. And one of the biggest culprits to me is the Southern Baptist Convention because you've got these mega churches all over, sprawling campuses, multi-million dollar budgets. You've got a strong missions deficit. So what do you do? You go to the mission field north of the Mississippi and you build all these little churches and you establish these pastors in these churches and all that, then you go and leave them. You don't support them. Third one. The third contrast here. True and false spiritual guides. Verse 3. Peter says, Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Katakurio. What does it mean? It means to rule looking down at others. Rule looking down at others. Not as being lords over the flock. Uh, turn with me. Uh, leave your finger there again in our text. But turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 to 28. The same word is used in verse 25. Not as being lords. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 to 28. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, but those who are, and those who are great exercise authority over them. So he says there were two kinds of these false guides. There were the dominant dictators that you learn to hate, and there's, there's the charismatic controllers. Those you love because of their personality and that, and then they use that personality for their own personal gain. Verse 26, Yet it shall not be so among you, but you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 11.1? 1? He says, Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. A good example of this type of a autocratic, uh, domineering uh, dictator is Diatrophes in 3 John verses 9 and 10. What is interesting, friends, today, and this is something that we need to be aware of, is the ecumenical movement, which is permeating denominations today. You have a lowering of the standards, a minimizing of doctrine, and you all get to this lowest level where everybody can be unified in Christ and we could have this unified voice supposedly against the world, it's interesting that the ecumenical movement emphasizes the rule of bishops. It emphasizes the rule of bishops, the rule by the few. If you're going to have a one world government and a one world religion, Revelation 17 and 18 at end times, what you're going to have is bishop rule. You're going to have rule by the few. And that's a way then to dominate and to control. And that is a characteristic of the ecumenical movement in our day and age, and we need to be aware of that. What are marks of a true elder? They have a commission. They have a contrast. Third point is they have a commendation, verse 4. They have a commendation. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Jesus is the, shep the chief shepherd. All of the other shepherds then are under shepherds. They have an accountability to Christ. They have a seriousness to their calling. They have a ministry to eternal souls. There should be a real humility connected with their calling. Spurgeon said, don't go into the ministry unless you have to. I remember growing up in the Vietnam era, and I remember being put into the draft, getting the numbers and all that, and waiting for the numbers to be called. And I can't tell you the number of classmates I had. All of a sudden decided they're going into the ministry. Well, why are they going into the ministry? 
They avoid the draft. There's no call from God to the ministry. I'm just going to avoid the draft. And those same men today, my age, many of them are leaders in congregations. Leaders in denominations. I wonder how many of the faults there are among all of those. I also take it very seriously, friends, on who fills the pulpit at Grace Baptist. Politicians, candlestick makers, and bakers do not fill the pulpit at Grace Baptist. Those who stand here in Christ's stead must have a calling from God. They must realize the seriousness that's involved to preach and teach God's word. Over a century ago, Matthew Simpson said of the preacher-teacher, his throne is his pulpit, he stands in Christ's stead. Around him are mortal souls. The Savior unseen is beside him. The Holy Spirit broods over the congregation. Angels gaze upon the scene. Heaven and hell await the issue. What association and what vast responsibilities. I know of one pastor in the area who spent the first 15 minutes of every sermon telling jokes. And when there wasn't laughter, he said, you can laugh at that, it's a joke. He stands in Christ's stead. His message is the word of God. Around him are immortal souls. The Savior and seed is beside him. The Holy Spirit broods over the congregation. Angels gaze upon the scene. Heaven and hell await the issue. And what association, what vast responsibility. Get that false guy out! We have them all over today, don't we? But it's interesting to me when you look at this verse, with great responsibility comes great reward. An unfading crown, the crown of glory that does not fade away. We're going to have the Olympics on TV shortly, and, and they're going to have these medals. But back in Paul's day and Jesus' day for the Olympics, they had the Stephanos, the wreaths. Only it says here, the wreaths of garland, it's not going to be perishable pine or myrtle. It's going to be an unfading crown. We went through a study last Sunday night on crowns. In James 1.12, it talks of the crown of life. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 and 26, the imperishable crown. Revelations 4 and 4, gold crowns. Future reward. And the metaphor of the crown is an emblem of what is awaiting in a life hereafter. There's three general ideas connected with the crown. It symbolizes victory. It symbolizes a festal gladness and an abundance and it also symbolizes the gold crowns. It symbolizes a royalty and a sovereignty. Literally, the crown is life. It's glory. It's incorruptible. It all refers to the same thing. The life is eternal life. The glory is we'll see Jesus as he is. It's God's character perfected in, in his saints. It's incorruptible. It's non-fading. Why? Because it'll be continually maintained by Christ. Continually main Christ, maintained by Christ forever and ever. And the gold crowns, gold crowns, yes. Revelations 1, 6, and 5, 10. He has made us kings and priests, and we shall reign with him. It's all right, as an elder in a church, to labor for rewards. Why? Because of Revelation 4, 10. It says you cast your crowns before the throne. Someday, to prostrate before the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, and to cast the crowns before him, the rewards before him, and to say, it's all of Christ. All the work is his. All the merit is his. All the glory belongs to Jesus. Romans 11.36, For of him, from him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And when does this occur? It occurs at the second coming, the eschaton. It's interesting to me that Peter mentions second coming three times. Three times, raised as a superlative in 1 Peter 1 7, 1 13, and here also in 5 4. Peter is a model elder, lived in light of eternity, so should we all. 
4-7. But the end of all things is at hand. We know that, friends. But do our lives acknowledge it from day to day? I can't tell you how it's influenced my life when Spurgeon, it said of him, and on the door of his study, he put that sign, perhaps today. I have that in my study. I trust that some of you have done that. That's over on the table over there. But that will affect your attitude every day. Perhaps today, Christ will return. What are the marks of a true elder? They have a commission, they have a contrast, and they have a commendation. Do you know at Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, where John MacArthur has served as pastor for 43 years, they have an office of pastor and elder there. They also have deacons and deaconesses. Phoebe was a deacon, deaconess in Romans 16, 1, and Yodian and Syntyche in Philippians 4, 2, and 3. But you know what's interesting? That they are not church offices, per se. They are servant roles. They are servant roles. They serve under the pastors, the overseers, the bishop, and the elders, and they also serve the people. But whatever polity the church group has, it emphasizes the importance of the office of elder, including a pastor elder, and it being an awesome responsibility. Let's just sum up quickly what we've learned then in, in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. Biblically, elders have two roles. They shepherd the flock of God, and they oversee the flock of God. They look over the flock for the purpose of leading them in the steps of Christ as they, by God's Spirit, endeavor to lead by example. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul said to the Corinthian believers, Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. And James 3.1, they do so in light of that. Be not many teachers, for you will receive the greater condemnation. No wonder Spurgeon said again, don't go into the ministry unless you have to. But while there's a great responsibility of tending, caring for the flock, there is also in 1 Peter 5.4 the great reward for those who are faithful under God. And to hear Jesus say someday in Matthew 25.21, Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things, enter into the joy of your Lord. And when does that occur? That occurs, friends, again, with the second coming of Christ. 1 Timothy 3.1 says this. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. And one must remember that that desire, that compulsion, must come from God and for the right reasons and ends, as stated here in 1 Peter 5.2-4. When God calls, he also enables it's an awesome responsibility, but that responsibility of love to God and love for his own flock also brings great joy and reward, even amidst great sorrows and persecutions. Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, so now fill a little while if need be. You are grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold which is perishable, though it be tested with fire, may be found to result in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word of truth. And I pray, Dear Heavenly Father, for the elders of this church and for churches across America, dear Heavenly Father, that they indeed know the commission they have from Christ that is indeed a compelling, dear Heavenly Father, an inner desire, a compulsion, dear Heavenly Father, to be true and faithful to the word of truth, to preach it and teach it and to live it out before others, dear Heavenly Father, to be used by God, to be an ambassador of Christ, to call others into the kingdom. We pray, dearly Father, for the faithful leaders who will then minister to an ever-increasing